Hello, welcome back. In, in this segment, we're going to talk about polymorphism in Java, and I'm reluctant to start this discussion by saying this word because everybody looks at it and thinks that's nothing that they can relate to and freak out. So don't think about that word. It is the title of the segment, and I'll explain that word again only at the end when we already know what it really does. So let's start out by reviewing where we were a couple of segments ago. We were talking about the inheritance hierarchy, where we decided that a dog is an animal, and other things could be an animal. So this is is a, and this is the inheritance relationship between classes. So the dog class extends the animal class. And we'll go back and look at the code for for the dog and the animal and we'll add the cat class so that we actually have a hierarchy. Okay, now here's the declaration of a reference variable to something that to to something of type dog. And we can make an instance of the dog class and assign it to that reference variable. And here's um, a reference variable of type cat and a creation of a new cat object and also similarly an animal. Now this is the part that's new. A dog is a animal so this assignment is valid. The data type of the pet variable is animal because a dog is a animal we can assign dog to the variable pet. Similarly, we could assign the a cat object to the variable whose data type is pet is is animal. Because a cat is a an animal, we can assign a cat object to an animal reference variable. And what couldn't we do? Well, we can't assign something that isn't an animal to that reference variable. So this is the first step in understanding um, polymorphism, that word that I wasn't going to say. I want us to go right away to the code, and let's go back and forth between the slides and the code so that you don't get lost in the abstract concepts of it. Okay, so here we are, and this is the code that we had before for an animal, and the animal class extends object, we can take that out now because we know that if we don't put extends there that the parent class is object. And we can also take this out. Java puts it in there for us. This is a call to the object constructor method. And <clears throat> as soon as you understand that Java puts it there, people don't bother anymore. So this is a very simple class. It has one instance variable to wait, one constructor, an accessor, a mutator, and a two-string method. And with, then we made the dog class, and the dog extends animal. That's the dog is a animal relationship. And we notice that a dog has a name. To make a dog, you pass in the weight and the name. Immediately call the constructor of the parent class an accessor and a mutator for the name variable and a two-string method that calls the parent's two-string method. I added a cat class using exactly the same format. So um, a cat has a name as well, and it also has a, a variable called neutered. So an instance of the cat class could be neutered true or neutered false. So here's what it takes to make a cat. You pass in the weight, the name of the cat, and true or false, if the cat's neutered or not. Call the parent constructor, which is a call to the animal constructor. You might notice that the all of this is the same except the accessor for neutered. Instead of get neutered, we're going to call that is neutered. So we could say if my cat dot is neutered and it would return true or false. So there's a, a slight difference in the naming convention for Boolean instance variables. 
the rest of this is the same. So none of this is surprising, but I would like you to enter this class as you go along so that you can play with the um, relationships between cat animal and dog animal. So this would be a good place to pause and enter the cat class into your code. Now let's go to the test inheritance. And this is the same we had before. We made an object of type dog and we changed its name, we changed its weight, and we printed out the dog. Max is the most common name for a dog in the United States. I, I, you never know what you're going to learn in these videos. Let's make a cat. Um, <clears throat> what does it take to make a cat? Do you remember? The weight, the name, and whether he's neutered or not. I'll say that Fluffy is neutered. And let's print out the cat just to make sure that we have what we want. Okay, here's Fluffy. A space would have helped there. Neutered is true. And Fluffy is an animal weighing 1212. Okay, I'm going to go and find out why I'm printing out the weight twice. That would probably be in animal. Nope. Oh. I was demonstrating in the previous one that we could call the constructors that were inherited. I mean the methods that were inherited, um, including get weight. So that's probably also in the dog class. And there it is. We don't need to print out the weight because we did that work in the parent to string methods. Okay. So build and test. That makes more sense now. Okay, so we've demonstrated making a dog and making a cat and we made an animal. And now we want to look at if we declare a reference variable of type pet, we can say pet gets what can be assigned there, an object that is a dog, an object that is a cat, an object that is an animal. So let's say Fluffy. Fluffy is an object of type cat and it can be assigned to a reference variable of animal. You might notice that the opposite is not true. If you had a reference variable of type cat, you could not assign an animal. Do we have an animal around anymore? My pet. And this won't compile you would have to say that an animal is a cat, and that doesn't make sense. But you can say that a cat is an animal. That one does make sense. I'm going to take that out. Now let's do system out print line of pet. And now say pet gets max, which is a dog. System out print line of max and I'm going to go and change the no that that's okay let's just run that and make sure that printing out the pet <coughs> okay printing out the pet might be printing out a cat or a dog or an animal so we print we printed out fluffy first and then max That's, um, let's take this in very small steps. This is the first step. You can have a, a reference variable of a parent class and assign an object of one of the subclasses. If you're seeing that happen, then it's time to go to the next, the next page. Okay, when you assign an object to a reference variable, this is the same as passing an object to a method. 
So think of this method here. We've defined a public static void foo, and it takes an animal. Okay, when you call this method, what can you pass to it? Think of this um, a, a method signature as what does the what does the that should say method? Darn it! What does the method want you to pass in? This method wants an animal. Okay, so I can pass it an animal. Can I pass it a dog or a cat? Yes. So it's it's like an assignment when you pass something to this variable. I could pass a dog or a cat. So let's go and do that in the code. Small steps. So what I did is I defined a, a method called foo right after the end of the main that takes an animal. And this compiles and does nothing. But we can demonstrate that we can compile a call to this method passing in a dog Here's where the dog Max is declared, and a cat. Here's where Fluffy is declared, and an animal. So it's the same as the assignment of Fluffy to pet. We have Fluffy assigned to an animal reference here. So passing the cat object to an animal parameter is, is pretty much the same. So keep adding this to your code, and it will be comfortable with for you if you um, if you see it working. Okay, inside of this method I have a, an animal. And if I type animal dot, what pops up? All of the things that are available in the animal class, including get weight and set weight, and the things that are inherited from object. One of the things that's inherited is the toString method, and if I call the toString method from animal, let's print that out. And I'll just put a little a, a note here that says I'm in foo. So we won't get it mixed up with the other outputs. So my question here was whose toString method is being called? If I pass in a dog whose toString method is being called, and when we hover over that, it seems to indicate that the animal toString method is the one that's mentioned here, the one in the animal class. So when I run this, when I passed in a dog, I wind up calling the toString method of the dog class. If I pass in a cat, there's that space. I'm calling the cat if I pass in an animal. So this method call could be any of three different methods. It could be the animal's toString method, the cat or the dog. If our inheritance hierarchy were, were bigger, it could be a call to any of those two string methods in, in the animal inheritance hierarchy. So let's go back to the slides and I'll explain to you why this is happening. So I want to tell you about the concept of compile time type versus runtime type. The compile time type of a variable is easy. Look at this declaration here, animal pet. Pet has the data type of animal. Now we're going to assign that variable a dog object. So when we get to this line of code, the compile time type of pet is animal, but at runtime, what kind of an animal do we actually have? What kind of a thing is this right now on this line of code? And at runtime, the object that we have here is data type dog. So when we use this object to call a method at runtime, we do something called dynamic method binding. And we're going to look in the dog class for the toString method. 
So in our code, when we passed a cat here, then at runtime, the animal is a cat. But at compile time, the animal is a data type animal. So compile time of this variable is different from the runtime type of that variable. When we hover over this and it says you're calling the animals to string, be careful with that. It compiles because the animal class has a to string method. But at runtime, it's not the animals to string method that's going to be called. It's the runtime types to string method that will be called. So if we passed in a dog, it will be dog. If we passed in a cat, it will be cat, and so on. So compile time type and runtime type. The compile time type, how you declared the variable, and at runtime, what kind of an object do you actually have when you get there? I, I said that about four times. Maybe it's monotonous, but this one you have to, you really have to get this one. Let's go back to the slides. Okay, <clears throat> I kind of forgot I had this slide in here because it's the same thing that I said, I already said four times. So inside of the foo method, we have the compile time type is animal and the runtime type, we don't know. We don't know until someone calls it. So looking at this method foo, we don't even know what kind of an object we're working with. We only know something about it. We know that it either is an animal object or it inherits from, it is an object that inherits from animal. So we know something about the object that gets into this method, but we don't know what kind of an object it is. It might be time to start thinking about the power of this. We can write a method now that takes an animal and a year later, if we add the bird class to the animal hierarchy, could we pass a bird to this method? A bird object? Or an iguana object? If it inherits from animal, we can pass it to this method. So this method could be accepting objects of a type that we haven't even thought of yet. And if a year later we think of a whole bunch more animals to add to our animal hierarchy, then this method will still work. Okay, so we've got this issue inside of the method foo where the parameter data type is animal. How can we find out inside of this method what kind of an animal we have? So we're introducing here the instance of operator. It's an operator. It looks like a method call because it's a big long word, but it has no capital letters in it. On the left, the left hand operand is a reference variable and the right hand operand is the name of a class. It evaluates to a Boolean. So inside of this method that takes an animal, we can say if my pet instance of cat and that will evaluate to true or false. If the caller of the method passed in a cat, it will be true. If the caller passed in a dog, it will be false. So we can check if it's a cat and we can do some cat-like stuff here. We can check if it's a dog and we can do some dog-like stuff here. We cannot check to see if it's something that it cannot possibly be. So the instance of operator won't let you check to see if something that is an animal is a string. So the compiler knows that the animal class does not inherit from string. So something that is an animal cannot possibly be a string and it won't let you check that. It will let you check if it's a dog, if it's a cat. It would also let you check if it were an animal. So my pet instance of animal would be a valid thing except it will always return true. So if something is an animal, 
instance of animal will always be true. So if it's if it happens to be at runtime a dog, instance of animal will be true. If it happens to be a cat, instance of animal will also be true. That seems counterintuitive, but that's how the instance of operator works. Let's go to the code and just try that. So inside of the foo method, we can say animal instance of cat so inside of foo I'm a cat Oops. and you have to spell instance correctly I-N-S-T-A-N-C-E. Okay, if it changes color, it's probably right. My typing is so bad today, I'm going to do a copy-paste and ask if it's an instance of a dog. Info, I'm a dog. And then I'm going to ask, just to demonstrate what I said at the end of the last, looking at the slide, I'm an animal. So let's run this and see what it does. So the first time we're in foo, it says I'm a dog. We passed in max. So this evaluates the false. This evaluates the true. And I'm an animal evaluates to true. Instance of animal evaluates to true. So we can find out in here, we can ask the object what it is using the instance of operator. And if we type animal instance of string, this will not compile. Animal cannot be resolved to a type. Let me just make sure that that's the error message. That, that wasn't the error message I was hoping for. Here's the error message. Incompatible conditional operand types animal and string. So something whose data type, his compile time type is animal, you cannot ask if it's a string, it won't compile. That's, that's the error message I wanted. So I, I, I'm just going to delete that. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is the override of the equals method. So you know how to override the toString method. The object class gives us a toString method and we say thanks but no thanks. We want a toString in our classes that makes sense for our particular classes. So we also inherit a method called equals and we want to override that one as well. It, it allows us to define when an object is equal to another object. So when are two dogs equal? You get to decide that by defining the equals method inside of the dog class. And when we override a method, remember that we have to override, we have to use the signature of the method we inherit. So we inherit from the object class an equals method that has the object as the parameter. So here's our, here's our eventual objective. We're going to go into the code in a second, but this is what we want someone who is the user of the dog class to say. They, I want them to say max.equals rover, and it will evaluate to true or false. And whether that method evaluates to true or false is up to us. We define the equals method. We decide when two dogs are equal. So let's go and look at doing that overriding the equals method. Okay, so let's go into the dog class. And a dog has a name and a weight. First of all, what we want to do, I'll do it up here. So it's it might be a little bit easier to see. It won't go off the bottom. Public boolean equals, and it takes an object. 
I always call my objects OBJ. I don't know why. It doesn't compile because we haven't returned anything yet. Okay, this is how I would like the method to work. The phone rings again. Okay, so I think all dogs are equal, so it would be a very good thing to do is just return true all the time. This little green thing says we are overriding the equals method. We, if you get one of those, then that's a good sign. Well, of course I was being facetious. All dogs are not equal. We should compare something to make sure that they are equal before we return true. So I'll declare a boolean result. I'll assume that the dogs are not equal, and then instead of returning true all the time, I'll return the result. And then in the middle, we will decide what it means for two dogs to be equal. Well, if their weights are equal and their name, their names are equal, then the dogs are equal. We could say that. We could say that if their weights are equal, then they're equal. So let's start out with that one. Let's say if um, the two dogs' weights are equal, then the result is true. Okay, so what are the two dogs that we have to work with in here? Remember the expression on the slide, if max dot equals rover. So the two dogs, Max and Rover, how do we address those two dogs in here? One is passed in as the object, and one is this, the object that gets us into the equals method. So Max is this, and we could say this dot weight. How about get weight, because we're going to use the method inherited from the parent class is equal to, so that would be max in the expression max dot equals rover, obj's weight. Okay, so the second dog that's passed is passed in here as obj, and it doesn't compile. I knew it wouldn't. Let's look at the error message here. OBJ, uh, let's, well, darn it, let's call get weight, and I'll get the error message that I wanted. Okay. The method get weight is undefined for the type object. Well, we passed in a dog. Someone who's calling this is going to pass in a dog. And we want to call the get weight method from that dog but it won't let us because the compile time type of obj is an object. So your first inclination will be, well, why don't we change the data type here to dog so that that would work? And we could, let's try it and see what happens. Okay, now it compiles, but we lost our little green triangle here. This is not an override of the equals method that we inherited. So our objective is to override the equals method. That means we must put object here. And then that raises a problem because the data type object doesn't have a get weight method. Okay, so first of all, let's put up at the top. A lot of people do this. If obj instance of dog and now I'm going to invert the invert the logic if not return false they're not equal if you're comparing a dog to a horse they're not equal So a lot of people choose to do this. At the beginning of the equals method, they check to see if the object being passed in is the appropriate type. If you're comparing a dog to a horse, the answer is they're not equal. So 
if not object instance of dog return false. Do that right at the beginning so that you will only return true ever if you have a dog object. And you'll only get to this part of the code if you have a dog object. So the reason I, I, I told you about that is because we have this problem down here. We have an object that we know now must be a dog. But it won't compile because the compile time type of OBJ is object. But we know that the runtime type is dog. Or we would have left the method up here. So if we get down here, what we're going to do is we're going to downcast this reference variable to be a dog. So we looked at casting variables when we were working with primitives. You can downcast a double to an int, for example. And we're going to downcast this object to be a dog. So here's the cast operator. It still doesn't compile, but we get a different message. The problem now is that the dot operator has a higher precedence than the cast operator. So this syntax takes a little bit getting used to. Let's look at what we just did. Downcast the object to be a dog reference. So you're telling the compiler, I know that the compile time type of OBJ is object, but at runtime I really know I have a dog. So the data type here according to the compiler, the data type that's highlighted there is now a dog object. And the dog object has a get weight method. So now what we've done, let's summarize what our equals method has done. We check to see if the dog passed in, the object passed in is a dog. If it is, then we check that the weight of this dog is equal to the weight of the dog passed in. And if it is, then our result will be true. Otherwise, we'll return, well, we'll return a result in any case, but we would have returned false if the weights are not the same. Let's go and test our equals method. So I need two dogs. I've got one dog here called Max. Do I have another dog anywhere? No. So let's just make another dog up here. Here's Rover. Gets new dog. And I'm going to say that this dog weighs 35 and his name is Rover. Don't know why I'm using uppercase for dogs' names. So what we can say now is if max.equals rover, then output a message. Max and rover are equal. Otherwise, Max and Rover are not equal. So let's run that, make sure it works, and then we'll think about it for a minute. Okay, Max and Rover are not equal. Let's change the weight to 34 and run it again. Max and Rover are equal. Okay, they're equal by our definition. And our definition is the equals method that we put in the dog class. Okay, let's think about it. We passed in Rover, whose compile time type is dog. What data type does the equals method want? Well, it pops up conveniently and says it wants an object. Is a dog an object? Yes, everything is an object in Java except the primitives. So we can pass anything into that equals method. We can pass a dog and a cat. 
and a bird and anything else we have, including a string, a random number generator, anything that is an object. But what we really wrote that method for is to compare two dog objects and determine if they're equal. Okay, think about that. The upcast happened implicitly. We passed a dog object to a reference variable of type object. We passed the dog to an object, and that was an implicit upcast, a reference variable upcast. And inside of the equals method in the dog class, we needed to do an explicit downcast. So we can downcast this object to a dog. It works the same way casting of variables works the same way with objects as it does with primitives. An upcast happens implicitly and a downcast must be written explicitly. So this is a, a downcast. The only reason we had to do the downcast is because we were required to use the object compile type here. Okay, so this is kind of important. I, there's, there's something here that I guess I'll have to tell you. I haven't really explained why not just use dog here and then not worry about this downcast. Other classes are expecting that you have overridden the equals method and when they call your equals method, they will expect the data type of the parameter to be object. So this is um, a pretty hard rule that you, in your classes, you should be overriding the toString method that you inherit and you should be overriding the equals method that you inherit. Okay, let's, let's look at a summary of what we've done in, in this segment. We talked about the compile time type versus the runtime type. So you satisfy the compiler first. That means that the code must compile and then when it runs you can figure out what kind of an object you have at runtime and work with that. The point there it was exemplified by the downcast of the dog object. So we downcast the object compile time type to the dog data type and then we called the get wait method from the dog. So we satisfied the compiler by doing the downcast and then we called the get wait method so that at runtime we would actually be calling a method from the dog object. Dynamic method binding is the concept that we looked at in this segment. You call the method from the object that you actually have, not from the method of the compile time class or the compile time type. What we've, what, what we've added to our repertoire of things we can do is that we can now write methods that take different kinds of objects based on the data type of the parameter. And our example was you can write a method that takes an animal and then you can pass into it anything that is an animal. And you can then later on add classes that are an animal and pass them to that method. And that method will still work even for data types that you hadn't considered when you wrote the method originally. And I said I wouldn't use this word too much until we got to it, but this is um, one of the definitions of polymorphism. So what is polymorphism? Literally, it means many shapes. Um, but for me, a better definition is more practical of what you can actually do. And I think a better definition of polymorphism in Java is something around where you can say we can write code without even knowing exactly what kinds of objects we have. 
And the power of that is that you can then later on pass different kinds of objects to the same method. And um, I hate to say animal processing, but you can write a method that does animal processing and then um, pass different kinds of animals to it. We also looked at the instance of operator in this segment, and you can use that to find out what kind of an object you have at runtime. So what is the runtime type? And we overrode the equals method. And this is going to become something that you should do in every class you create. Create a definition of what does it mean when something equals something else. So you should always be overriding the equals method. And that was the first time we saw the downcast of a reference variable. Okay, this was a lot to take in, but this is an important one. And we'll have an exercise um, on, on this pretty soon. I'll see you in the next video.